Good morning, church. How are y'all this morning? I am not Earl Wayne. <laughs> he is out today, and so uh, he's he's uh, he asked uh, for somebody to fill in. And I said I, I got you covered, brother. So uh, this morning uh, I will go over our, our announcements and our prayer list. Uh, a few announcements, uh, real real fast. Uh, if you've noticed our backpacks, these look really stuffed and full. These do not. We need these to look like these. So I know some of y'all have been packing and buying for the backpack, so I want to remind you of that uh, to, uh, to stuff a backpack. Uh, WMU came by Friday, and they were, they were packing and packing and packing and uh, they were doing a great job and so I'm excited each one of these backpacks is a precious soul it's it's so much more than a backpack and uh, they will go to children in our state and uh, there's some great stuff I was getting excited just looking at all the stuff that's in there so I want to remind you to be a part of that ministry participate in that you will be blessed and God can, can use those in an incredible way. Also, next Sunday, in the very, very bottom, underneath on your prayer list, if you grabbed a bulletin this morning, uh, you see Watermelon Blast next Sunday, uh, August the 16th at 5 p.m. Uh, we've got Watermelon. We've got Bluegrass Music. Right, brother? We got, I got a thumbs up. And so uh, we're going to be on the parking lot. Bring your lawn chair. Bring uh, your drinking water, uh, we'll social distance, we can spread out, we're going to eat until the watermelon's gone, uh, we're going to listen to music, and we're just going to have a great time. And so I want to invite you, and you can invite people to come uh, and kind of do that. Uh, if not, I told, uh, you know, if, it, if the blacktop gets hotter for the temperature, uh, we'll go to Savannah and Lonnie's, we'll sit on the porch, they got, I mean, it's... We can sit over here on the grass. I mean, we've got that whole area over there. So uh, we can spread out and social distance. Um, for our prayer list, if, uh, if you look at our prayer list this morning, we still have uh, several names on there. I uh, need you to remember, if you would, uh, Junior Humphrey and uh, Miss Jane, if you'd remember them. Uh, I know that... Uh, uh, he's been been struggling with some health things, and I just want Junior and Miss Jane to know this morning that we love them. Church is praying for them, and uh, uh, want to continue to do that. So if you'd add them to your prayer list as well, uh, Sarah uh, Chickenpox, she has gone back to work. She went back to work last week, and I think how's she doing? She's it's man, it's all right. We'll continue to pray. Continue to pray for her as she gets her strength back. Uh, many of you have asked about my mom. I appreciate that. Continue to pray for her uh, during this time. And uh, does anybody have uh, any updates or anybody they'd like to add to the prayer list this morning? Yes, sir. That's, uh, that's Mike on the prayer list, Steve's brother. We have physical and spiritual needs to pray for there. Anybody else have anybody want to 
Yes, sir. Amen. It's uh, it's interesting. It's interesting to find uh, uh, you know new ways to do church, new ways to do ministry. Every everything is different. There's there's nothing that that's the same. And so uh, and it's not you know it's 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 every church. Yes, Miss Mary. We still collect the same. That's right. We're still. That's right. And and how the eleventh mile? And you told me earlier. Okay, and how, where where are we at on our goal for that eleventh mile? Two hundred fifteen dollars. All right. So we are on mile eleven. That's a lot of pennies. Yes, that's right. She takes green green paper too. The mile of pennies is on the back. Yeah, thanks, Miss Doty. Yep, right there underneath the uh, the deacon of the month and our contact information. So it's on there. It stays on there. So thanks. We need the reminder though, because uh, we're not together physically as often. So we need some extra reminders. Anybody else have anything? Anybody have any unspoken? If you just raise your hand, if you have some unspoken, that's. You know, we have we have a lot of things uh, uh, we need prayer for, and uh, God, that's the that's the beauty of our Lord. Right? He uh, He knows everything about us. He knows our needs. He knows our prayer request. And so, uh, would you join me this morning as we go to our Lord? We just pray for for these these many needs and the and the unspoken. Father, we thank you so much, God, that we can come together. And Father, it seems like our world is upside down right now. And Father, even what seems chaos to us, God, you are still in control. Nothing's changed about that and nothing ever will. You will never lose control. You've always been in control. And there's nothing that takes you by surprise. And Father, I lift up these names to you on this, this prayer list. Father, these are our, our friends and these are our family and these are uh, precious people, Father, to us, but we know that they're precious people to you. And Father, there's physical needs, there are emotional needs, there are financial needs. Father, there are even greater, there are spiritual needs. They're all intertwined on this prayer list. And Father, we just pray that You will work in a mighty, incredible way to those that need healing. Father, physically, we pray that You will just, just do something mighty, a mighty miracle in their life, Father. For those that are struggling emotionally, Father, and, and mentally, God, and they're battling uh, these things in their, in their mind, they struggle, Father, we just, we just pray that You will, will just intervene, Father, and You will step in and comfort them and calm their mind and, and, and keep them from the attacks of the enemy. And Father, for those that might be struggling financially during these times, and, and Father, they, they don't know what they're going to do, God, I just pray that You'll provide for their needs in, in some form or fashion. 
And Father, for those that are spiritual in needs, those that are lost, Father, that need salvation, God, to you, that's, that's the greatest need of all. Father, I pray that, that something will be done or said that, that they will turn their hearts to you and they will give their lives to you. Father, be with our churches. Be with the pastors. Be with those that lead. Those that teach, Father, as we are navigating through uncharted waters. God, I'm so thankful for the people here at Kevill and their patience and their understanding, Father, and how they've adapted, God. And I pray that you will bless them and continue to bless them. Father, I'm so proud of how they've responded with their understanding and their encouragement. And Father, I pray that we will continue to be unified, that we will continue to be uh, flexible. Continue to do the things that we need to do and to continue ministry here, Father, in, in the midst of this ever-changing world we live in. And Father, I pray that you will just meet with us today. Father, I pray that you will speak our hearts. That you will renew our spirits. And we leave here this morning that we will be changed. We will look different. And walk in this place because we've been in press. It's in your precious name I pray. Amen. This morning I'm going to turn for our children's time. If our children want to kind of make their way up here to the row and uh, we'll turn it over. I'm going to call her Coach T. I'm tired. Call me Trina. Call her Trina. Call her Trina. Call her Good morning, everybody. Um, our scripture today is, but God... But God said you must not eat the fruit of the tree and you must not touch it or you will surely die. You will not surely die, servant said. Uh, for God knows when you eat, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, serpent lied. Like God knowing good and evil. Well, last Sunday, Miss Sue talked about the world. Remember God created the water and the land and the plants and she talked about loving roses and y'all talked about trees and grass and all the things that he created. Well, before we talk, I guess I brought these cookies, which I might get in trouble with parents, right? They're stealing everything. The parents, they probably have plenty for parents, but anyway. Um, we're going to talk about them in the But before we do that, I know you're wondering why I brought the cookies. I have to see something for y'all. It's good and tasty. These cookies look so good. I'm tempted to eat one right now. And I know you are too, but I, I love these. Well, what if, let me tell you a little story about the big word, temptation. What if your mom and daddy told you you can't have cookies for supper, and supper's on soon? Well, so you go out and play, and come back in, and you, and you think, I'm kind of hungry. And a friend or brother or sister comes in, I'm hungry, I kind of want that cookie. You know, mom and dad said, don't eat that cookie before supper. Don't do that. They want to eat more. Come on. So they had a cookie. Well, your sister or your little friend came in and said, I want a cookie. So you might have eaten three cookies for supper. Knowing that your mom and dad said, don't eat that cookie. Well, it's supper time, cause, and you're not hungry. And your mom said, do you eat cookie? Only one, maybe two. She said, you disobeyed me. I told you, even though you're tempted, temptation, that big word, to eat those cookies, and now you're hungry. So you can't go to a friend's house, there it is. Well, and then different things to different people. Uh, it might be like a toy or something that belongs to somebody else, just because you want it, and you don't want to have it. And I have a little video of my granddaughter taking money out of her. Let's go to so and show it. And her, you know, didn't want to say, you know. And now I'm her name. But she's taking money out of her daddy's truck. Has her little sunglasses on. She was tempted for that money. Well, that none of those things are really big sins. But you've got to remember you need to do. Tell, you need to do. Your mom had tells you to do. Oh, you Well, we'll talk a little bit about Adam and Eve. God created the world, a beautiful place, these beautiful plants and animals. He needed somebody to take care of. So he created Adam. And then he created Eve. Well, because he had him to be by himself. Well, what happened was um, he, gave a, he gave them a beautiful home, a Garden of Eden. But he said one thing, do not eat the tree in the middle of the garden, or you will die, like the verse said. And the uh, serpent, the devil, Satan said, you will just be as wise as God. So go ahead, eat that fruit. So Eve decided, I'll eat that fruit. And said, 
um, gave them to Adam. Uh, as soon as they ate them with you, they had sinned. And so their father was God. And they kind of gave the game. Okay, he made me do it, he made me do it. Serpent made me do it. Serpent said, be wise to do that. When God or the parents tell you to do something, because temptation will get you. And then the earlier you can say no, and the older you your parents, grandparents, and God talking in your little head, then the easier it is to say no. So uh, I left some out, but it's a good deal today. And ask your mama and daddy before you eat the cookies. Kendra told me to say because she's uh, would never gone over the and she wouldn't want to eat the pizza. <laughs> Let's say a prayer and give a cheers to this. God, thank you for this book and thank you for this blessed children and help them to um, seek guidance and their guidance and to obey. And, um, thank you so much for 10 years under the down cross, save my soul. And um, Christ's name on Amen. Cookies are yours. <laughs> yeah. You want some cookies? I'd rather him be having cookies. <laughs> 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 this is the place for five guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not a I'm also not special music this morning. So, I'll spare you that. We last moment. Change on the music, and so I can slap more at the last minute. And so we're just diving to work this morning. That's okay. I'm gonna get my my I'm not the during. I might. I mean, my need. I don't know. I had this morning, but this morning uh, I'm asking some questions. Now I know you're high. Okay? I know that's like the end of the service when I kind of ask you. Oh no, I must actually say something. No, I'll go. Uh, it's really easy. It's just kind of like raising your hands. Okay. And raise your right hand or your left hand. It, it, does, it doesn't matter which one. I'll let you do this one. Just raise okay. Has anybody in the room ever experienced like uh, a, a difficult event? Has anybody in the room ever experienced sorrow? Anybody in the room ever experienced grief? Anybody in the room ever had this completely unexpected happy moment? Say, where did that come from? See, what kind of it's the same, but right? it, it, it kind of this. What happens, right? Life, life just happens. If you're in this world, any period of time, you, you will understand that, that life happens. And I want to look this week. At a, a text of John 16, verse 30, 16, verse 3. You can get Luke and flip us through the, it's, uh, well, that's all right. It's, it's kind of catch up, catch up with. Uh, so if you have your Bible, if you will turn to Luke 16, actually the text up on the screen this morning for you, but that's okay. Because it's been kind of a morning of changes and we're going to roll with it. So if you have your Bibles, John 16, verse 3, and this is Jesus speaking. He says, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world, you'll have tribulation. Your tribulation may grow as well. But take heart, I have overcome the world. The number one in your list, and if you have your book, there's also sermons in there. And the uh, first one is this. Life happens. Life happens. This is in this world, you'll have tribulations. I want you to know this morning, church, just because you become a Christian doesn't mean you are free from problems. Because we live in a fall world, and as a result, bad things happen. We are not exempt. It does not matter if when Jesus didn't say in this world you may have troubles or in this world you might have setback but he said to his disciples in this world you will have troubles now here's the context of the passage starting in John chapter 13 the next chapters in John for the last Jesus spends with his disciples we read 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 we need to hours our days our weeks are like the last hours Jesus spent with his disciples John chapter 16 Jesus has a farewell passage to his 11 disciples Jesus had parted and a little while he's going to go with soldiers who will us Jesus starts out in chapter 15, and Jesus is not making some defending about what's going in their lives. He's saying, this will happen. This will happen to you. You have this happen. We know from what after Jesus was recorded in this, from the earth's history, that things all happen. They were all true. And I've told you this thing. I will listen to uh, <coughs> the text and what Jesus is saying, what could happen. He said, I've told you things so that you will not stumble or be called off God and fall away. He said, this is a little bit of a wing here. I'm, I'm telling you these things so when they happen, you won't be like, Oh, I can't believe that happened. See, sometimes we get shocked things happen. Good. We should understand that we live in a fallen world. We should understand that the world hates God. We should understand the world certainly would hate Jesus. And the world hated Jesus. He hated the thing of Jesus. That's the church. He said, I've told you these things so that you won't shock, you won't cough, you won't follow. He said, we'll put the sin God and make you a We'll put you out. And if this come in, whoever kills you, that's encouraging, right? The time comes when whoever kills you, ten of the eleven disciples were murdered. They were martyred. John was out of prison. Now, 
So whoever kills you will think these officers to think that what was supposed to be. Saul was with your church. He's a fellow God. He's doing his fat. He will do these things. They will do these things. He don't think about these things. But they have not father or men. I've told you these things now. So when their time comes, you, uh, you come to the will that I told you about them. So this is warning what happened alive. Uh, chapter 13, Jesus tells the coming of the Holy Spirit. It's necessary for Jesus to leave in order for the Holy Spirit to come. And he enters one last time. He says, you will be more know what's going to happen to you. The world will rejoice. You will grieve, but you'll grieve. Suddenly turn to one joy. It'll be a loss of pain. Joy. Notice what Jesus did tell him. This day in this I told your life now. In life, you'll never be sick. You'll never be poor. You'll never be needy. It's not your going to be the way you have these problems. In this life, this life, it's always be sunshine and kings run out. So teach it. Ah, where they get from the scripture. Because it's that's what this is all, and it's the opposite of what this is true. It's Jesus' sugar quality while the weight is false. He was preparing this life for upcoming tribulations. Jesus' word should prepare us for things that will But it also is the word we can find for and hope. It's not all doom and gloom. It, it's they're covered and found in these words. If you really have some medications that you throw on the floor and they drop and they roll under the table, they're, they're, they're right there by the last supper. Sorry, guys, get those. Some medication, there's, there's a warning label, right? Usually they come with a kit now. Like you can't get all the warning labels instead of the bottle because so many of them. So they give you a booklet, right? I get these fold out so you look like an old time map. You remember what's for? Kid like, I'm mad. Hey, what's that? This was maybe you drive or be with your door drinking all these people. You scare up a little vet through machine. Uh, this says uh, swallow whole sprinkle contents on small amount of food. Take before meals. Do not be rushed. This one. You should have prolonged excess or artificial love while taking medication. Okay, so, so the warning labels. Now, the world has one warning label. It might read something like this. Living in a fall world caused illness, abuse, broke relationship, betrayal, our law, three, poverty, disappointment, disasters, heartache, crime, and death. And, and that's basically what Jesus, you know, he gave us a warning label. But also think about that. This is in this world, you will have tribulations. But there's this, this conjunction, watch your fight. I'm the first little thing on the scarred life. In the world, you have tribulations, but I have overcome the world. So, two, he just overcame the world for us. It's overcame the world for us. He said, Take heart, overcome the world. The word take heart, this phrase take heart, it means keep up your courage. Don't lose heart. When you are standing in front of the enemy, do not be afraid and keep standing your ground. So, so the image of take heart, it is the same as in Exodus 14, 13 through 14. When Moses and the Israelites are at the Red Sea with the sea in front of them and the enemy charging and closing in behind them. Can you, can you picture that, right? Possibly two million people at the Red Sea. They've been in slavery for all those years. They're finally out. They're finally free. They get to the Red Sea and they're like, uh-oh. There's nowhere to go. And probably off in the distance, they could hear the horse's hooves and the chariot wheel and the armor clanking and crashing, knowing that they were closing in. They might have been able to even see the dust cloud in the distance. And here they were. They're like, well, we should have just stayed in Egypt. Now we're all going to die. You brought us out here, Moses, and we're just going to die in the desert. And then Moses told the people, do not be afraid. Just stand still and watch the Lord rescue you today. The Egyptians you see today will never be seen again. The Lord himself will fight for you. Just stay calm. Take heart. Stand your ground. Do not be afraid. Jesus said in John 16, 20, your sorrow shall turn to joy. James says to consider it a great joy, my brothers, whenever you experience various trials. Sometimes that's easier said than done, right? He says take joy. Consider it a great joy. How many of us, me included, consider it great joy when we fall into troubles or tribulations? I'm like, come on, James, Really? You got nothing better than that. Give, give me something else. But no, he says, listen, that you consider it joy. We, we experience those. And then the word joy, and we looked at it extensively on Wednesday night when we were going through the book of Philippians because that's one of the themes that, that runs through that entire epistle. But this word joy, what is it? Well, joy is a vertical perspective centered on God. And, there, and there's some things, some characteristics of joy. What do we know about joy? Well, we know that joy is one of the fruit of the Spirit. We know that joy is attribute of God. 
We know that joy goes deeper than happiness. You know what? Those cookies make me happy. And when I'm eating those cookies, I'm very happy. But what happens is, is when the cookie's gone, I'm not happy anymore. Joy's not like that. Joy goes deeper than happiness. Joy is content in all situations. When we are in tribulation, we consider it joy because joy is one of the fruit of the Spirit. And, and the devil can't take that from us. We have to give it to him. Joy is lasting. Christ is the source of joy. Joy, it's a, it's a character of us. It, it's, it's from the inside. And joy intensifies in crisis have you have you ever been in some of the hardest most difficult times of your life but yet you still had joy that's an incredible thing it, it, it's amazing how that works and you're thinking how how can i i've been you know i talk about my trips and and this is one of the best example i really never really knew what true joy was until i met somebody in africa and I met somebody in Haiti that's living in a tent with thousands of other people. Tent, 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 tents with no food, no water, nothing to their name. But yet there's an unspeakable joy in their life that, that just takes you back. Because their joy is not in their circumstances or situations but the the joy of the lord is their strength you see we are not defined by our people. so we've established that troubles will come and we know that jesus overcame the world so number three is how do we respond how do we respond well we have two responses number one we can draw near to god or number two, we can withdraw from God. We can either draw near to God or we can withdraw from God. The choice is yours. How we choose in, in those situations, that's up to us. We can doubt. We can get discouraged. We can deny and turn away. Or we can run the arms of the only one that can help us. And here are some things to keep in mind when we are navigating through difficult times. Tough times are not wasted. Tough times are not wasted. There's an ultimate purpose. Romans 5, 3 through 5. It says, We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials. For we know that they help us develop endurance. And endurance develops strength of character. And character strengthens our confidence of hope and salvation. And this hope will not lead to disappointment. For we know how dearly God loves us. Because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. It's a progression here. Suffering, it, it develops endurance. And endurance is the power of going through an unpleasant or difficult process or situation without giving way. Being able to go the distance without quitting. And that suffering, it produces endurance. And then endurance, it produces character. Character is the mental and moral quality distinctive to an individual. And that character, it develops hope. And hope in Scripture means a strong and confident expectation. And a biblical hope is not an escape from reality or from problems. And we know from the Scripture, it says, and hope does not disappoint you see hope changes how we see ourselves hope it changes what we value hope it affects what we do with our lives tough times are not wasted we are becoming more and more like christ and in that process there's three things and the first one is this or a in your bulletin god is revealed god is revealed it is a difficult time we see god at work through the tribulations that we see God at work. I, I've shared with you uh, about being diagnosed with leukemia, and uh, that was in 2003. And uh, when I was first diagnosed, those first several weeks, I was going to bring it with me. To, I forgot to. I thought about it last night. I have this, this chest. It's this wooden chest about this wide and it's about this tall. My, my mother-in-law told me to put cards and things that people had sent me during all that. And every day I went to the mailbox, it was packed full of cards and letters and checks and gift cards from people I had never, ever met, from states that I had never, ever been to every day. Every day we'd come home and we'd pull up on the carport and there would be sacks of groceries hanging on a doorknob from people that loved us and cared us. 
I remember sitting in the car one day and we wept over a roll of toilet paper. Because somebody cared enough about it. I couldn't shave with a, with a regular razor, right? Because I couldn't cut myself and take that risk or anything. Or get infected. So somebody had, had bought me an electric razor. This time and time again, that little chest is so full when I lift the lid, stuff spills out of it because I, I kept stuffing it down in there. Over and over and over again, I saw God revealed in ways that I'd never, ever imagined. And it is through those tough times, it is through those difficult times that, that God is revealed. In Romans 8, 18, he says, For I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that's going to be revealed to us. The present sufferings that we're going through now cannot even come close to comparing to what awaits for us when we get to our eternal home in heaven. None of these things. These are just minor temporary inconveniences in our lives compared to staring face to face in the, in, the, in the glory of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We need to keep that in mind. We need to keep that in mind, church. We've got to look past the temporary. Paul looked past the temporary to the eternal. He was always looking past the temporary to the eternal. If he focused on the temporary, he never probably would have wrote anything to anybody. Think about that because he's in prison. And if he would have focused, I'm in prison. I'm never going to get out of prison. It's about me, 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 me being in prison. I've been beaten. I'm getting nowhere. I'm not making a difference. I'll never see my family. I'll never see my friends. But his hope was in Christ. The hope of glory. And he kept his eyes focused on the Father. And we have to look to the temporary. This is only temporary. He had his eyes fixed on heaven and the promise of eternal life. It's easy to focus on our current situation. We must not focus on it, but focus on the Father. Letter B is growth reach. Growth reach. It's hard to see how we are going through difficult times. It's during these times that we grow the most. And, 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 and that process, that growth, you know, we, we, we say this little phase, going through growing pains, right? The reason why we say that. And it's the same, it's physical, but, but it's the same thing spiritual, right? It, it's hard to see that we're, when we're going through these, but it's when we grow the most. And that process is often painful. And there's two biblical illustrations that show the painful process brings about both. And one is the finer's fire, another is pot hand. In 1 Peter 1, 6 9, he talks about trial by fire. So be truly glad there is wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. See, see Peter knew, Paul knew that they were temporary. These trials will show you that your faith is genuine. It being tested as high test implies gold. But your faith is far more precious than your gold. So when your faith remains strong, many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. You love him even though you have never seen him. Though you do not see him now, you trust him. You rejoice the glorious, accessible joy. Melting point gold is 1,940 degrees Fahrenheit. And it burns the impurities away. Now, I've been around with melted gold, but I've, I've melted lead before. And it put a lock of lead or the ink of lead in, in that pot, crank that heat up, and it begins to melt. And as you see it begin to melt, the impurities come to the top. It's black, it's dirty, it's nasty. You take the impurities, you see them off top. And even lead, when, it, when it's been melted, it's shiny. And, and, and so the impurities, you rake them up, and that's, that's what's happening here. They're being refined by fire. What's happening is the trials, the tribulation, these tests we're going through, these, these impurities, these things are bad for us. They're burning away, and they're burning more Christ. There's the potter and the clay. I see first verse 28. There's no one who calls the name, who rouses himself to told of you, but you have hid your face from us and have missed in the hand of God. But now, Lord, you are our Father, and we are the way. You are our Father, and all of us are the work of your hand. Now, the opportunity to work with clay and some knowledge, not a lot, but it was to kind of expose us to the process, and it was enough to expose me to the process so that I like it. I don't want paint. I don't pray, all right? If I ever come in, I've got a hard set up here, and I love clay. Run. Okay, it's, it's, there's a why. And, and I made some little items in high school in art class, right? My mom still has them displayed. 
And you know, your mom's always, you make stuff and you take them home to your mom, especially when you're a kid. She's always like telling you how good it is. That's so nice and that's so pretty. And it's bad. It's horrible. You know those animal zoo that are making art now? Have you seen that? Like, there's zoo, they're raising money, and like, elephants paint pictures with tusks, and monkeys are painting and different things, and eaters like making pictures, and they, and they sell them to raise money. Well, that's, it looked like one of the zoo animals made them. And every time I'm in visit, I look at them, I'm like, oh, that's bad. But there's a process, you know. I'm like, that's, that's a lovely thing. Hey, hey, I'm going to take the clay, I'm going to start making it into a bowl. Because clay has a bubble. And when you put something that's air bubbles in the kitchen, you got it, it's going to explode. So you get the air bubbles out of clay. And so the way we do that, we all in class, we take it over and we slam it on the floor. We pick it up and we slam it. And you punch it and you, beat, and you form it and you shake it. And you beat all the bubbles out of it. And then you put it on a little potter's wheel and you begin to make it. And you're like, oh, that's horrible. And then you like smush it off and start all over again. And you finally get it where you're going. And you finally get to where you make it, right? And you glaze it all up. And then you put it in a kiln. Now, modern kilns take pottery and bricks. They are up anywhere from 18 to 20, uh, 800, 400 Fahrenheit. But took things to make it into something. You put a kiln. You're like, please don't blow up. Please don't blow up in the kiln. Hope I got all the air bubbles out. Hope I got it made right because it, it's kind of tricky. And you put it in there and there's this, this firing process. And then you open up the door and you're like, right? You're peeking in. And then there it, it, it made it through the kiln. Now, you can form clay into pottery without a kiln. You can take the clay and you can make it into something beautiful and gorgeous and, and just let it dry in the sun. But to have pottery to keep and to use, it must be fired at a very hot temperature. It's a painful process. But we must go through the process in order to grow. And better see the last grace received. Grace received. And this one's so good. When we're going through troubles, Jesus covers us with his great grace. Paul suffered from what he called a thorn in the flesh. We know what that thorn was, even though many people have speculated. Uh, I want to clear the air with you right now. I'm going to tell you what it was. If you're, you're like, oh, well, some, there's people that said, you know, well, he was beat so many times that his vision was bad. And he had this. He was, he was a short man. He was kind of hungry from all the beat. All these things. We don't know. Hey, we don't know. Scripture didn't tell us. Uh, we just know the thorn in the flesh. It was something. The uh, Bible didn't identify it. Didn't identify, didn't identify it. We can speculate all we want until I come home. We don't know. That's not what's important. I know that's something that Paul paid for. He didn't remove, but God's response was to not remove it. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 through 10. He said, that My grace is sufficient for you. Your power is perfected in weakness. And this was Paul's response. Therefore, I will most gladly boast all the more about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may reside in me. Grace is received. Believe, watch how we respond during tribulations. People are watching to see how we respond during tribulations. People are watching us to see how we respond every day in this world. Code, no code. Especially code. How do we respond? It's part of our witness. We live the words we speak. People to know God. Our struggle, tough times are not wasted. If you read the story of hope, there's one that I do not fully understand. In short, just some serious fouls, right? He lost his belongings, very, very wealthy. He lost his family, and he was driven with painful sores that covered his body. Even his loving, compassionate, caring wife encouraged him to curse God and die. That's a sarcasm, therefore. But Job wouldn't. Job wouldn't. He replied, naked I came into the world, naked I will leave. The Lord gives, and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And after several conversations with friends, trying to figure out what's going on, they're analyzing the situation, they're giving them advice, did you do this, did you not do that, you did that, you did not do this, this is what's wrong. In chapter 36, there's this passage that jumped out at me and has spoken to me ever since. And it's in the 16th verse of Job 36. And, and I love this. If you, if you make note cards or if you want a Bible verse, remember, if you want to write this down, it's where 